you will. You ever think? I don't think anybody ever thought they would live this long. Ninety-eight. Ninety-eight. No. Uh, All right. Whenever you're ready, Al. I, I hear that all the time. I was gonna say. <laughs> long as they stay over there. Yeah. In that house and that one right there, they do a lot of that stuff. All right. You good? Yep. All right. You ready, sir? All right. So let's start in uh, 1924, Atlanta, Georgia. Born 1924, September the 3rd, 1924, in Atlanta, Georgia. What do you remember about growing up in Atlanta? Well, I remember my mom told me where I was born on the side. Well, there's colleges, uh, Marsh Brown, Clark, Morehouse, Atlanta University. I was born, she said, maybe three blocks or four from Marsh Brown College. That was the college I wanted to go to rather than Clark and Morehouse because I, you know, it was more manly. You know? <laughs> yeah. You have four siblings, is that right? Hmm? Four siblings? Four what? brothers and sisters? It's gone, yeah, all of them gone yeah. now. Two, old, uh, two, two were older and two were younger. Do you have any sibling rivalry growing up? No, no, no. no. When you, when you P.O., you don't have any problems. I didn't say P-O-O-R, I said P-O. And, uh, you know, we learn as a people to live together. When all of us are in the same boat, we don't have to worry about one trying to outdo the other. And that's the way it was. We grew up in communities where it was, a, it was poor in Atlanta. We lived in what they called places or alleys where houses used to be in uh, Jefferson Place and uh, another place over there in Atlanta where we were. Not far from David T. Howard School, where I went to school in Booker T. Washington. But uh, we learned how to help one another. When everybody's poor, not poor, they know how to help each other. You know, I want more brag about the other when I put them down. Let's talk about, you mentioned uh, your high school. A few years after you graduated, another guy came behind you, and you were living next to him. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. Martin Luther King went to high school right after you graduated. Y'all live pretty close to each other, is that right? Right across the street. Y'all ever have any interaction? No, I, we were young then and poor. On Albany Avenue where Dr. King lived, about a half a block from where we were living all the way, the rest of the way, you had your people who had been tremendously blessed, like Dr. King and others. Uh, Hamilton was a, a lady who was a principal in one of the schools over there. We uh, we just tried to live the best we could. So, t did you have any experiences with racism growing up in Atlanta in the in the twenties, thirties? Well, it, personally, no, because you had a black neighborhood and you had a white neighborhood. And most of us, you know, stayed where we were, and they stayed where other people stayed where they were. Did your parents ever tell you anything about racism? They told us about being who we were. You're my son. I want you to grow up to be a, a man. And this is where they taught us to not worry about what's going on around us. You can't change people. You can't change things. Just be the best you can be. And I had uh, my oldest brother and sisters were twins. Then I had a brother and a sister who were younger. They all died. One in uh, Cleveland, uh, the oldest boy in Atlanta, and my youngest sister in Atlanta. But uh, we didn't worry about color. It didn't. White people lived over there, blacks over here. And, uh, you know, very seldom did you mix. You know about that. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't worry about it. We were just happy to be alive growing up. And we did everything we could do to keep from embarrassing our parents. What did you play in high school sports-wise? 
Uh, I played part of a year at Booker T. Washington in Atlanta football. Mm -hmm. No baseball? Mm -mm. So no. let's fast forward to 1943. You jump into the Marines. What was the what was uh, behind that decision to, to go into the Marines? I was drafted. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, and uh, we went to Fort Benning to be inducted in everything. And that was a Marine sergeant. There was a Marine sergeant there. It was about four or five hundred of us there, laying a line. He came by and he picked out nine of us. Fall out, fall out. Went to the Marines. And we went to Montfort Point to, be, to train. And uh, that was it. So you were at Camp Lejeune, is that correct? In North Carolina? Montfort Point first. Montfort Point, okay. Yeah. You ran into Dan Bankhead, is that correct? Yeah, I saw him. You know, we weren't close, mm -hmm. but uh, I saw him there, you know. Did y'all ever play baseball together? No. No? No. Did y'all ever interact later on after he had made No, we majors? didn't. We didn't. We were only interested. When I went into the Marines, I was only interested in, I was a squad leader. Mm -hmm. I was only trying to learn how to be a leader for the people that I had in my squad. And in our platoon, the 34th Marine Depot, we, uh, that's where I was in. And so I was interested in trying to look out for the nine people that I had to look out for. So 1945, you were at Iwo Jima. Can you just, how do you even talk about that? Describe it, what, what it was like. Well, it was, <laughs> It was a terrible place. It, it was a, it, it, it had a, the island there, uh, Iwo Jima, five miles long at the, and three miles wide at its widest point. That's how it, that island was. And it had a dead volcano on one side of it. And that, that terra firma, as we call it there, it was nothing but ash, volcano ash. That's why so many Marines got killed. They couldn't dig in. And uh, the Japanese had it marked off. They didn't, they didn't bother us until we got about two or 300 yards in it. And they began to drop those mortars. Boy, and they had that island saturated where they could drop them. And that's what killed most of the Marines, the, the mortars. And after I think over 6,000 Marines still on that island, over 6,000. But we came back and went to Hawaii to regroup. By that time, we were getting ready to go to Japan. And uh, we re regrouped. Next thing we know, we were on a ship headed to, to Japan. Uh, we were going to where well, they dropped one of those atomic bombs, Nagasaki, we saw that. And uh, we were there, I stayed in Japan for uh, about 14 months. And we didn't have anything to do there but just do guard duty for the Marines that were there. What did it look like after, when you guys, when you guys got there, after the bombs were dropped? You saw one or two little ch chimneys. Mm -hmm. The rest of it was gone. It was a terrible sight because it just took everybody out and it, it had a lot of fire in it because a lot of those people who were there uh, had burns on their faces and everything. And it was a terrible place. So there's a pretty, you know, I don't want to say famous story, but you made a promise to God on that island. If that he right? saved me, anything he wanted me to do, I would do it. And here you are. Well, see, when we were growing up, our parents taught us to fear God and obey your parents. They taught us to fear God, obey your parents. And, and that's the way it was. And uh, my mom, mostly was my teacher, uh, she taught us about being who we were. Don't let this skin color you. It's not this, it's what's in here. It's in the heart, not the head. 
anybody can put up a front, but to be who you are, you got to have something in here. And that thing you have within you is the love of God. If you love God, you want to treat people right, not worry about them. They called me. In my professional baseball career, I played in places where it was awful. Call you all kind of names. You know, it didn't worry me. I just pitched a little harder. <laughs> Whatever they, they would start calling me all kinds of names, I just threw a little harder. And it worked out pretty good, you know. And my parents taught me, you have one mouth and two ears. Nothing have to stay in here. Let it go out. Whatever comes in is dislikable. Let it go out. That's the way it's been with me. So one more thing on your time in the Marines. Uh, I want to make sure I'm saying the name of this. The, it might be the volcano you were talking about. The famous picture of them raising the flag. You Were were you there? Oh, that? oh yeah, I was there. <laughs> what was it like? What was that scene like? Because we've only seen pic, you know, that one picture. Well, we were, we were down on near the beach. We were a supply company, you know, help bring stuff in. Uh, and we, we heard that trumpet blow, and we looked up, and the guy had a small flag up on Evo. And then after a while, they took it down and raised a larger one. Only, I think, only three of those guys who were on Mount Suribacha lived. It was six of them, I think, and only three made it off, made it out of the thing. And uh, that was a, that was something to be proud of, man. You, just being a Marine uh, made you proud. A few of the proud Marines didn't mind what word about dying. We just wanted to be a good representative of who we represented, and that's the way it was with us. So let's go back. You you get out of the Marines, and you go to Atlanta. And you play semi-pro football. Uh, <laughs> Before you got into baseball, you played football. You were a quarterback. You played a little bit every position. Is that right? Yeah, uh, quarterback. Could you throw but, it? Oh yeah, run it too. Kick it. I was a bad. The Atlanta All Stars, man. We we had a team. We traveled. We went to quite a few places and. Uh, that's what I think opened their minds up to have a pro team in in Atlanta. Uh, I played uh, quarterback, did pretty good. We only lost one game in two years, and uh, I don't know. I just think God thinks well as did. All right, so we're nineteen forty seven. You start your baseball career. Um, and you played against the Birmingham Black Barons. Yeah, I was in Nashville, no, Asheville, North Carolina, and they were doing the spring training. Mm -hmm. uh, they came to Asheville to play, and I was star pitcher. Started that game that night, and they knocked him out after the second inning. So my manager, put me in, and I pitched the next seven innings against them. So when, that was on a Monday night, and uh, Saturday, Friday, my manager called me in. He said, you gotta go to, you go into Birmingham. I said, for what? We're not playing there. They, they, they bought you or something. I don't know about it, you know, but they had me on a, Bus or whatever it was that I came to Birmingham, 1948. What's your first impression of Birmingham? Well, you know, when you live in separate areas, mm -hmm. you make the best of what you have. And we had a place down on Fourth Avenue here in Birmingham. A guy had a nice restaurant there, and a couple of them right around there. And that was the area where most of us congregated. And uh, we didn't worry about mixing. It was just wanted to help someone enjoy yourself. And that's where it was. Uh, they had this place called Bob's Boy. 
and uh, another one around the corner. But uh, I just was just happy to be now in with the Black Birmingham Black Barons. So there's a guy that I absolutely love who's not with us anymore, Piper Davis, Birmingham baseball legend. legend. What kind of man was he? Uh, Piper was something else. He's a great mind in baseball, a great manager. I remember one, I was kind of young in the game, you know, and I didn't think nobody was supposed to hit me, you know. <laughs> so we were in a game and a guy made an error. And uh, I got on the mound and I lobbed the ball up there. And I lobbed and the next thing I knew, Piper was in my face. He said, what's wrong with you? He didn't see it like that. <laughs> you, do, you, do you throw a strike every time you throw that doing ball? He, makes, he can make an error just like you missed that plate. And don't you ever do that again. And from then on, you know. Yeah, Piper was about 6'6", six, six, tall fella. Yeah, he was something else. He, he never made it to the majors. No, he, he was triple A. Uh, he was a great mind. That boy was something else. He was a great ball player. He, he, he could have played in, in the majors with any team up there. Second base, Piper Davis and Artie Wilson. Artie Wilson went up the coast and, and Piper Davis. We had had a good ball club. Mm -hmm. 1948, some kid named May shows up. What's your first impression? He was not old enough, old enough to play yet, professionally. Oh, but he, he played with the Black Bears. They got us up. They found him in Fairfield or somewhere, and they brought him over. And at the time, uh, let me see, Ed Steer, Bobby Robinson, and Jim Zapp, those were the outfielders. And so Piper brought Mays over. They had to move the mother fellas over and out, you know, to another position. So he came and he he didn't he was not a good hitter when he first came, you know. You feel bad sometime if you struck out. And Piper kept encouraging him and and that's the way way it was. So Willie, um we said that he was not old enough to play professional ball. Do you know how they got him into games? They saw him over in Fairfield in a, a semi-pro game. Mm -hmm. Somebody on our team. And so they brought him in and we began, we became teammates and friends. Still, I got a call from his secretary today. I don't know what's happening out there. I hope he's still with us. But he, uh, so I've heard that they would have him play under assumed names to get him on the field sometimes. Is that right? Not that I know. Okay. So what kind of athlete was he? Was Willie? One of the best. Incomparable. In everything. Catching, running, throwing. And he soon learned to hit. That was a picture of us when That's we the won the... Famous picture. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he was, he was somebody. So let's talk about, uh, about Rick Wood, one of my favorite places in Birmingham. What do you remember about Rick Wood Field? One of the best places to play. And I used to enjoy pitching there. I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember losing a game, Rick Wood. You know what game it was? The one that sticks out in your mind? No, I just, I just thank God I had a chance to be there and to be a part of a great group of guys. Now there's a picture with Willie Mays and I on. Did you see that? Yeah, I've seen that picture before. That one? Yeah, I've seen this one before. Y'all had a good pitching staff too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is this is what's our team. There's a really right at the two of us right there together. Huh? Hold one of those. Up. You can. 
What number did you wear? I think it was 16 or 18. 16 or 18? Yeah, one of the two. Yeah, this one of the, one of the teams. Yeah, there's Willie and I together. We still, I got a call from the secretary today. I got to get, I called back, but I didn't get an answer. I hope he's still with us. Um, what makes Rick Woodfield special? It was just a good place to play. The dugouts were bad, but other than that, it was a, it was a great place to play. And, uh, I think they're dropping off food. Um, what does it mean for Rickwood to still stand for the city of Birmingham? You know, they're bringing back baseball next year. Well, Rickwood served as a gathering bringing the whites and blacks together. We didn't ever play against the white team, yeah, but it was a place where people congregated. Whenever we played at Rick Wood, that park would be full. And I don't know when the whites played, it wasn't like it was with us. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people, not many people did show. But whenever we played, that park was loaded. And we just, Tried to be the best we could. Uh, Negro American Leagues in 1948, you had the clinching game against the Monarchs. Do you remember that game? Kansas City. Yeah. Yeah. They had a good team. Oh, yeah. Uh, Baker, uh, Roberts, uh, Hank Thompson, Willard Brown, all of those guys. You know, we had played, started three games, and then when, we were tied, and uh, it rained the night our star pitcher was supposed to pitch. So I said, Skip, give me the ball. Give it to me. And it was awful that night. I had some stuff. <laughs> I had a good fast ball that did this, and one went down, and I had a good curve ball, three quarters overhead, side on. I was a bad that night. Yeah. Do you remember what, you, what your line was that night? What, how many you struck out? How, many, how long you pitched? All that? I pitched the whole game. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't remember now okay. how many. Uh, so in a, you, you also pitched in the last Negro League World Series in that same year, right? Yeah. Yeah, against yeah. the Homestead Grays. Homestead Grays. Y'all got... got Got beat up. Beat up, yeah. Yeah, four games to one. But that one game was pretty memorable for oh, you. Oh, yeah, to be able to go because we were supposed to have had three or four other stronger pitches. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see, Newberry, Perry, Powell, Sam Williams, Hurd, and then myself. Yeah, we had about six other, five or six other pitches. But this night, put me in relief and I did all right. And that's how my life was with the Barons. But that, that game, that same game, you had a single late in the game and you ended up scoring the, the winning run, Willie Mays at the hit, is that right? Yeah. Can you tell me about what you saw when that happened? Do you remember what that was? Well, it was just, we were just happy to win against the, the Grays because they had something. Uh, they had a ball club, and, but we won that one game, and we mm -hmm. thank God for that. I do. Uh, I put all that behind me when, when I was called into the ministry. Uh, I came, I worked at a department store, and uh, then they asked me to take on a route, truck route. And I was over in the white community most of the, that's where my route was. Yeah. In your playing career with the Black Barons, did you ever encounter racism, anything like that? No. Nothing? Mm -mm. Was that a little surprising? No, it didn't bother us. We stayed where we were. They stayed mm -hmm. where they were, you know. And we knew where the places to go. And we didn't try to go someplace that they had no business going, you know. We stayed around our people. We didn't know any of the whites, so we stayed around our folk. So in 1951 and 1952, you went back with the Marines, second tour. 
But you didn't ever actually go on duty. You just played baseball, is that right? Well, I volunteered during the Korean War mm -hmm. when they called me back. I had a great year. I was having a great year. I remember, when, I believe it was in Houston, Texas. I pitched against somebody and pitched a shutout. And I called my mom. And she said, I got a call from from the Marines and they they want you to come back. I said, what? And of course, I got a trip back from Houston to Birmingham. And from there, I got a bus and made it back to Lejeune. And when I got back to Camp Lejeune, uh, I went to the office to see our commanding officer. Sir, I'd like to go to Korea. He looked at me. He said, you angry, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. You know a Marine ain't no good when he's angry. Put me in the mess hall. Help make sure all those trays and cups were clean for 30 days. When I came out of that, I didn't want to bother nobody. <laughs> yeah, I had a good chance. So did you actually go into back to, in the Korean War? Or did you stay stateside? I stayed stateside. Do you, you play baseball then? Yeah. yeah. So you played with the Camp Lejeune baseball team, is that right? Right. You pitched against Don Newcomb. Do you remember that game? Mm. One nothing shutout. Yeah, yeah, I remember. It was a battle. He's a big dude. I was a little and I had pretty good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not many people can say they shut out Don Newcomb. Hall of Famer. And then Jack Robinson brought his All-Stars here. And I got them too. Who was all on that Jackie Robinson team? Uh, I know Jackie. And I feel like there was another big star on that team. Let me see Jackie. Uh, I, I don't I don't forget all those guys. Yeah. So you got to, in the Marines, you attained sergeant. Is that right? You made I was order. offered sergeant. You were offered sergeant. I rejected it because I wanted to get out. So, in your time in the Marines, what they what did what did you learn from your time in the Marines? How to treat one another. Stay down here. It was a paradox. The way up mm -hmm. is down. I had to find what that meant. If you stay humble, you go up. But if you start up, you come down. That's been my life, just like where I'm pastoring now. I've had a chance to go to three or four other churches. So in the early 50s, you ended up signing with Oklahoma City. Um, did you know you integrated baseball in the entire state of Oklahoma? What's that feel like? Yeah. I just went and did what I had to do. <laughs> Uh, you know, you didn't run in. The only, there were only two places, I think, in that league that gave me a tough time. That was Shreveport and Beaumont, Texas. Of course, in Fort Worth, I had a guy, after I had pitched and won a game, I went and sat down in the bullpen and they didn't have no covering. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I feel something water hitting me and I looked over, here's a guy standing up there. And uh, one of my teammates said, come on, Bill, and took me back down to the dugout. But uh, other than that, I didn't have a problem. So there is one story that I found of you. Uh, you mentioned there was some white lady who would harass you. Yeah, in, the, in Beaumont. Yeah. Called me all kind of names. By the end of the season, we got to get up. you, so-and-so. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I just smiled and kept pitched a little harder. So after the game, hey, Bill. I said, yes, ma'am. Boy, you, you, you're pretty good. I did my best to get you, but you just wouldn't give me in. I said, thank you. That made me pitch a little harder. <laughs> so at the end of the 1952 season, or somewhere in the 1952, there was interest in you because you had a really good year that year. It's the Yankees and the Red Sox both wanted you. Oh, yeah. And you would have integrated both of those. Yeah, both of them. You know what happened? I no, I don't know. You know, you didn't get in. You just put that uniform on and go play it and take it off and go where you're going. You know, and all we didn't we didn't question anybody. 
but it was a chance, the Red Sox and the Yankees. Yeah, I know those two teams. Was that disappointing? And now, uh, I always remember this. There's a reason for things, you know. You, you, you don't need to try to probe and open it up. And people have a reason for that. You had a reason for coming here today. So you don't try to probe into it. You just go on and not worry about it. So in 1953, you're traded to the Cardinals. And then a year later, you get called up. First black yeah. pitcher in Cardinals history. 54. Okay. Your yeah. first game's at Wrigley. What do you remember about that day, about your Major League debut? Well, it started pretty good. <laughs> but I hadn't touched the ball in two weeks. Nobody to play catch with. I just run it every day. And uh, after about the third or fourth inning, I don't know whether it rained or whatever, oh, I was out of the game, you know, and so I didn't worry about it. Um, so. It is interesting that you had to take a pay cut to go to the major leagues. I got those contracts in there now somewhere. Do you? Yeah. Uh, I made more in the minor leagues than I did in the majors. When I was called up, the Cardinals, they handed me a contract. I was making $1,200 a month. I come out and go to the Cardinals, they handed me a contract, $900. It's in there somewhere. I said, what the hell is this? They say that that's it. That's it. I couldn't argue. So I took that's why I didn't do too well with the young coach. So there's a quote you had that I want to see if you remember. You said, I tried to get there for years and then I got there and I didn't want to stay. That was the reason. Is that about right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. sums up your time in the major leagues. Yeah. I didn't want to stay, you know, because at that time, segregation was in bloom. Mm -hmm. Your teammates, uh, I don't remember with the Cardinals, I spoke to Stan, Stan Musil and who else, but none of them were real friendly to us. So I went uh, for two weeks and nobody played catch with me. So I just go in and run every day. So when you were called up, nobody would play catch with you at all? Mm. No. Oh. The white players were afraid of being stigmatized. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are so-and-so lover. You love black folk. If, you, if they played with you or something, you know, they would, t they would put labels on you. And if you showed any kindness toward me, you you had something to deal with. But I had an old boy from Oklahoma, I think Browning was from Oklahoma. Uh, he didn't care. Uh, he said, you're a person and uh, I'm a person and we're here trying to make this team. And uh, I didn't worry about it. So after the 1954 season with St. Louis, you end up going down to Puerto Rico and you guys had a a pretty good team. Uh, yeah, pretty Marty good. Wilson and Willie Mays. Oh, boy. Let's see. On first base, we had George Crow. Second base, Ron Sandler. Short stop, Don Zimmer. Third base, Buster Clark. In left field, we had... Uh, I know we had Clement. No, we had... Yeah, Clemente in right, Mays in center. And who else in left field? Roberto well, had a name for you. What was it? Mia Mano. What's it mean? My brother. Hermano, you know, Mia Hermano. What's that relationship? How did that relationship kind of start? We were like that. I encouraged him because he was young. And, uh, you know, he, he got killed in a plane crash. But we were just like brothers, you know, and we loved each other. And we learned to love one another uh, on, uh, on the teams that we were on because we depended on each other. What was it? What was, um, do you remember where you were when you heard about Clemente and the plane crash? 
That was, I think it was either New Year's Day or New Year's Eve. Mm, yeah, I heard something about it. I tried to, I wanted to find out what it really happened, and they told me it was going over there to help the people, mm -hmm. and something happened, and the plane went down, and you didn't hear much more about him after that. Uh, Clemente was a great soul with Pittsburgh. He, he really played some great ball for them. Yeah. So in 1955, you get back from Puerto Rico, you sign with Houston, the Buffaloes. Again, first black player in that team's history. Does that ever get old, breaking barriers? I don't pay, it, history? I don't pay it any attention. It doesn't last. See, a lot of time we were just used, used maybe to draw people in uh, in those leagues, a lot of them weren't drawing many people. Mm -hmm. But when I went to Oklahoma City, every time, every park that I pitched in, when I went to Oklahoma, when they signed me, it was crowded. It was crowded. I mean, the ballpark was loaded. And whenever I had, they had me on, they had me on to, pitch, that part would be. And we had a good time. What do you, so just something noticing, I get, you kind of talked about it, but is it something you get from your parents when it's, you know, don't let the racism bother you? It's not a big deal that I'm breaking this barrier. It's not a big deal she, I'm breaking. She didn't know about a paradox, but she said the way up is down. Could you understand that? How about you, young man? Yes, sir. <laughs> if you're humble, you got somewhere to go. But if you're not humble, you're haughty and up here, you don't have but one way to go, it's down. So she taught us that, and that's the way my family was. And I thank God for my mom. She was a great teacher. My daddy, you know, he's dead. But my mom was something else. She loved her children and she helped us. And uh, it was a tremendous blessing to try to glorify your parents. Let them know you had some sense, you had some training from your parents. And that's the way it was with me. I tried to love and show kindness to my mom. You know, I'd send her. If I got hold of a little money, I'd send her something, and she was appreciative of it. 1958, you were at AAA Rochester, and a guy comes along named Bob Gibson, and you kind of took him under your, your wing. Yeah. What'd you uh, teach him? <laughs> I taught him about that mound. I said, this is yours, you in charge here. You got the good arm, the good fastball and everything. Just stay down here and don't let the outsiders mess you up after game. If they know you pitched a good game and somebody want to take you to a club or something, don't do it. So he he took that f from me that it didn't stay long. And a little while after he came, he pitched the game to the next day, you know, he's St. Louis. He's a pretty intimidating guy. Almost People almost have a perception that he's mean when he's on the mound. Is that the way he was off, off the mound? Well, you respected it because he had a fastball that was pretty mm -hmm. quick. And uh, he knew how to make you uncomfortable up there. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not a little guy like me. He was six, but his gift was up here. It's about six, two or three or something. And he had a, well, that boy had some. So, I just learned this about you a couple of days ago, and I'm really interested to hear you talk about it. Havana, Cuba, you're playing down there the night Castro takes over. What was that like? <laughs> it, was, it was like, a, I don't know. He brought a few of his friends with him, and they paused and boom, 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 fired those weapons. I just moved further back in the dugout. <laughs> but everything went along pretty good. 
Were you ever worried about getting off the island when he took no, over? No. Did See, he, have, he, he, he saw something in Cuba that was happening in America. See, a lot of whites used to come to uh, Puerto Rico or Cuba and their own people, they, they were still down here. If you had this color, mm -hmm. you're still there. And he just, I don't know, he came to try to liberate and bring people up where we could live together and enjoy one another. And that's a problem that you have in many places today. Just because the color of your skin don't make you better than me. You got a mind, I have a mind. You have a heart, I have a heart. Who we love is up to us. Now, it's hard for you to love somebody if you can't be loved. You're gonna put yourself above people. I have some, a few of my members come out here and were, is that where I remember? I used to have a school teacher right there, next door, and one up on that corner. And they found out that I pastored Bethel Baptist Church. Have you seen the building? Mm -hmm. I have. Pretty large building. Yeah, huh? pretty big. And and so, just because I was at, at Bethel, it didn't make me bigger. It made me humble to be able to have a building like that with the people that we had in. I used to have a daycare in there. I used to have a, a, the Red Cross had a one part of it and, and uh, they care on the other side and all we needed was the, the middle part the sanctuary and the downstairs basement and we had a good time everybody worked together over there and it was a blessing to be able to be the pastor of the church and i never asserted myself i learned to stay humble you know i don't care what you have my wife and I stayed together 65 years right here. And we made a vow. If you ever go out, come out of that door, outside, you don't get back in. We're gonna make up in there, mm -hmm. not out here. So we stayed together 65 years and like the lady I have there, I had three ladies looking after my wife after I started teaching at the school up there. And uh, they stayed with her until she passed. I was in the pulpit the Sunday she passed. Mm. They called me. The first time I didn't pay them any attention. Next time they, I said, what's wrong? I said, you better come on and go home. They, they believe your wife is gone. I came in and went in the room home. All right, I want to put a kind of wrap up your baseball career real quick. You retired in 1959. What do you what do you take away from the Negro Leagues playing in the Negro Leagues spending time with those guys? I'm just sorry that they didn't get a chance to mm -hmm. go higher because they had some good players. But you know in the in the leagues they, they only had a few of them. you had to be kind of exceptional to make it to the major league. You could be equal with somebody. You gotta be a, up. And, and we didn't have too many fellas that had that major league quality. And that's why a lot of them didn't go. All right, so uh, let's talk about your time. You kinda, you started at Bible college. You entered the ministry. So you, that, that promise you made to God on Iwo Jima full circle. I didn't know it was going to come to pass. I said I'd do whatever. I, on my job I had 15 years time on working for the store and, I, and that's, that's a lot of money you putting in. And, and so one night I was in charge of the warehouse. Something happened on my way home I missed having an accident. And seemingly the Lord said to me, now is the time. 
So the next day, I went to the office. I said, Mr. Pazitz, I got to go. He said, Bill, what's wrong with you? I said, I got to go. I got to call. And uh, he said, you can work every now and then. I said, I don't know. And I came home and told my wife about it. She said, is you crazy? <laughs> I said, I just I got to go. And I haven't missed a meal since I did that. I've been tremendously blessed. I'm not keeping you too long, I'm afraid. I don't want you to tie yourself out there. <laughs> uh, so 6th Street, 16th Street Baptist Church, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. You were at 16th Street. The day, know, when but the, the day of the bombing, you were not. No. So what I, happened? Kind of walk me through that day. Well, I was playing. I, I had a semi pro team over in Fairfield, and they wanted me to come over and play with them. So that Sunday, they were going down to Tuscaloosa to play. And as we headed down that way and got about uh, part of the, the Bessemer, yeah. We got in Bessemer, we heard a boom. You could hear it in Bessemer. Oh, yeah. And uh, I said, turn the radio on, man, something like And uh, we went on and played, and so when I go back, I uh, saw what happened full of girls, and that bomb went off where we used to congregate after Sunday school on Sunday, in that same area where that bomb went off. God had a reason for allowing me to go play, because I could have been in that thing. You were lucky. Blessed. <laughs> Tremendously blessed, and of course we started uh, with a uh, fella had a hall over across about two blocks from there. We used to worship there on Sundays. My wife was a member of 16th Street, and of course that's where I started with her. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes on Sundays she said, "Let's go." I don't feel too good. And she said, I'm, "She finally got tired of that, you know. Had to get up and go." And uh, I'd sit in the back. She was an usher. So one Sunday, I'd been known to her and you and me. I'm sitting in the back there. The minister said, we opened the door of the church. Anyone here desire to become a part of this? And I'm sitting there, and the Holy Spirit says, time. I got up and I walked all the way down. And I had been going to worship with my wife every Sunday for quite a while. And when I went down, they looked. What are you doing? I said, I, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I want to become a part of the church. And everybody was happy about it. And so when we did go back in, that Sunday I was the only one that baptized. And from then on, it was all about the Lord. What was it like um, in the few weeks after the bombing at 16th Street? Oh, it was some angry folk. Some angry folk. They congregate and every now and then somebody quieted, it, cut it down because at that time I uh, had a governor and we had a Another police a chief here named Bull Connor or something else. But I was blessed to be alive. So you end up winding up at Bethel Baptist in 1971, and you've been there ever since. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell me about your church. Oh. Bethel Baptist, pretty good church. We have been supportive of schools and conventions. We were one of the few churches that, that did that. We, we support conventions, state conventions, and Selman University and, and, and um, school in Nashville. We send money to every, every month. And uh, I didn't ever bother them for no money. Mm -hmm. I was just glad to be alive. And uh, we want to give our pastor 5% raise. I said, no, you don't. 
And for 23 years, I never received a raise. I never asked for it. They told me what they would give me. I had to go to my first church. Guys came and sit on this porch. The Reverend, you know, we don't have much. I said, how much are you willing to pay? Well, we could start you at $20 a week, sit right here on this porch. I said, okay, boy, they were happy. I went back, went down in Bessemer State there for about 15, 16 months. I was blessed. How do you still do it at 98? I don't. It's the Lord's doing. I know, I, I feel pretty good. I mean, just my body is not as strong as it used to be, but I don't have any problems with, with my body and uh, my mind. Uh, see, tonight I go in and start getting my message together for Sunday. Yeah. Congressional Gold Medal in 2012. What was it like getting the call? We didn't know it. We didn't, we didn't know, but it was a blessing. It was a blessing to receive that congressional president of Obama gave it to us. Uh, we received that gold medal. It's in there. Maybe one day when you come over to Belfort and I can catch one of those guys, take it down in the museum, let you see what's down there. So you saw, you, you met President Obama, knowing what you He did. was out of town that day. All right, last little question for you. 2014, you go back to St. Louis, 60 years since you debuted. Did that change anything for you, how you looked at the organization? No, because they didn't, didn't do nothing, hardly. I, I think they gave us a thousand dollars. I had three other people to go with me, so I didn't worry about the money. Went out and uh, they wanted me to throw out the first pitch, and uh, I tried. <laughs> I was about halfway to mound the whole plate, and I think I bounced it up there. <laughs> what was it like inside the stadium? Oh, it was, it was quiet. There. You know, they they applauded and everything. But uh, I did. With that. I had to learn not to uh, pay too much attention to crowds because they can blow your mind, mm. make you think you're more than you really are, and all that kind of stuff. All right, last question. How do you want to be remembered? Bill Greaser. <laughs> just, just me. I leave that up to people. You know, I, I don't. Uh, and my people at our church uh, know that I have a spirit down here. Humble, uh, humble fellow, and help whoever. And uh, never sought to exalt myself. I always stayed down. I always wanted, I always wanted to push other people up. I just only. Uh, that, that, that promise I made on Iwo Jima, that stayed with me. Stay down here. I said, Lord, if you save me, I'll do anything you want me to do. Two of my best buddies got killed around me. One of them got a direct hit, and another one had a frag to hit him here. I helped, and, and our company commander said, if anybody get a hit and you leave it, hold, you go to get out of here. But when my buddy got hit, the two of them got hit, I, I left and told a couple of other guys, come on, let's get them down to the beach. I didn't worry about no stripes. I just happy to be a Marine. I have a wear that cap every day. U.S. Marines, yeah. I got nothing else for you, sir. Um, I don't know if you touched on it, and you can look at yeah. Alan when you answer. What was it about the game of baseball that intrigued you and wanted you wanted to play? Well, it, whenever you 
you have nine men on the field and one guy, one of the nine is in charge. A pitcher. <laughs> Nobody else can move or do anything unless that pitcher throw the ball. So I don't know how it was, but with me, uh, the fellas that used to be around, it started with the tennis ball. Mm -hmm. The tennis ball, and, and then the other guys saw it, and so it tried to show them how to throw the ball and everything in Atlanta. And, and just being, being a part of uh, such a great thing is a blessing. I never tried to assert myself. I always stayed here. I found that just stay down here. You'd be all right. You so know, for the life that you have lived and all the history you've seen, you've got to be the most humble person I've ever met in my life. Oh man! You mean you're remarkable, and you just you know. But but that the profit of man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. The way up. When I started in the ministry, most of the people that I were to pastor, they were here. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go there and uh, you got to worship me and praise me. I got right there and there with them. Some of them lived in the project. Some of them lived in other places, and nobody was rich. All the while, I was at South Side on 23rd Street, where we were. That project in front of us, oh man, it was something else. And even in Bessemer, uh, it was it was a challenge. And I just love what my mom taught me. Not my dad, my mom. Stay humble. Stay humble. I don't care how you're blessed. Stay humble, and learn to help other folk. Just like in this community, I used to be the only one that had a lawnmower. Cut that yard, that one, next one, this one. Never charged a penny. Never asked for anything. I learned that scripture, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And if you learn to be a giver, God will bless you. And I've been blessed. They wouldn't why I'm out here in this little old house. They were like, I can't sit in with one chair, lay in one spot. Mm -hmm. So what I need with 10 rooms around me and don't go in them? Nah. It's been a blessing being here. That's it. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you, sir. Did 